The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Welcome to worship at Park Royal United Church. I'm the Reverend Keith McPherson, and uh, thank you for dropping by and uh, participating and listening to our worship service today from Park Royal in Charlottetown. I want to thank uh, Roddy, who's up on the balcony uh, doing the sound system and recording this service for us today. And also thanks to Valerie McKenzie, who's filling in for Andrea this week as our music leader. And uh, thank you to Lisa Carmody for sharing her musical talents with us this week, too. As is our custom here, it's, uh, we open our services with a time for sharing good news moments. So please keep sending those in to me at uh, my email at Park Royal. Uh, a number of sources are reporting that our former Park Royal minister, Reverend Kevin, Kevin McKenzie, shot a hole in one at Strathgartney on Thursday last uh, week while out with Ron Lewis and his son Josh. It's his second in as many years, and so congratulations, Kevin, on this uh, feat of golfing prowess. And if everything goes well, there should be a photo on the screen of that feat. Kathy Pilkington wrote in to say that she is grateful that uh, those of us who have loved ones in long-term care can now spend much more quality time together with the easing of restrictions on the special care and long-term care homes. So as we gather our hearts in worship, we'll light our Christ candle And I invite you to join together in the opening call to worship. Igniting presence, your spark is here, your flame burns amidst us. We recognize that we are standing on holy ground, for all creation is holy and all who abide in it are called to be awake in awareness and care. Help us to notice the flame of your passion for healing and wholeness everywhere. Help us to turn our heads and be attentive to the lights of your constant compassion around us and among us. And help us always to remember that you are with us. In this time of worship, let us recognize the flame of God's presence everywhere. children and youth. It's Reverend Keith here for with the word for all ages. I have a question for you. Have you ever been a member of a fan club? Some of you may not even know what a fan club is. 
Is it still a thing? I think maybe it is. A fan club is a group of enthusiastic supporters of a well-known person, maybe a celebrity, a music group, or a sports team. If you were a fan of a particular sports team, you might wear a t-shirt with, with the team name and a picture of their mascot on it, like this one. Look at that, Harvey McAdam. And it says McPherson, Jones Masonry Limited on it. That was when, not mine, it was when my son Frazier played minor hockey. And guess what? It fits me too. If you were a fan of a singer or a music group, you might have their posters decorating the walls in your home. People my age, when we were growing up, for example, were fans of the music group known as the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. And we had posters on our walls of uh, the members in those music groups. One thing I have noticed about fan clubs is, the, is that the number of members in the club usually depend on how popular or successful a person or the team is. If a sports team wins a lot of games, they will probably have a lot of fans. But if they, but if they start to lose, the fans usually fall away. You know, a few years ago, the fans of one sports team went to the games with a brown paper bag over their head to hide their identity. I don't know about that one. If a singer of a, or a music group has lots of big hits, they will have a lot of fans. But if the hits stop coming, the fans will go away. Now, when Jesus was on earth, he had a lot of fans. As he traveled around performing miracles like feeding 5,000 people with only a few loaves of bread or healing a blind person, there were huge crowds of fans everywhere he went. But do you know what? Jesus wasn't interested in just having fans. He wanted followers. He wanted people to change their hearts and to live differently. One day he said to a crowd of people, If any of you want to be my followers, you need to do something. You need to stop just being a fan and show by your actions that you love God and one another and that you want to care for each other and the world. He said, you need to love God and love one another to be my followers. To be a follower of Jesus means much more than being a member of his fan club. It means that we live our lives in the way that Jesus taught and showed us. It means more than wearing an I Love Jesus t-shirt or a What Would Jesus Do bracelet or a necklace with a cross on it, although those are really cool things to wear and things that I've worn sometimes too. It means to follow the teachings of Jesus every day. It means to reach out to others, to feed the hungry, to be a friend of the friendless, to love the unlovely. In other words, it means to show the love that Jesus showed to everyone we meet. That is what separates us from a follower. It's good to be a fan of Jesus, but it's better to be a follower. So let us pray. Dear God, help us to be more than fans. Help us to be followers who live and love in the ways that Jesus taught us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And let's say together the prayer that Jesus taught. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thanks for dropping by today and listening to my story. And have an awesome week. Good morning. I'm reading from Matthew 16, verses 21 to 28. From then on, Jesus began telling his disciples what would happen to him. He said, I must go to Jerusalem. There the nation's leaders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law of Moses will make me suffer terribly. I will be killed, but three days later I will rise to life. Peter took Jesus aside and told him to stop talking like that. He said, God would never let this happen to you, Lord. Jesus turned to Peter and said, Satan, get away from me. You're in my way because you think like everyone else and not like God. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you want to, to be my followers, you must forget about yourself. You must take up your cross and follow me. If you want to save your life, you will destroy it. But if you will give up your life for me, you will find it. What will you gain if you own the whole world but destroy yourself? What would you give to get back your soul? The Son of Man will soon come in the glory of his Father and with his angels to reward all people for what they have done. I promise you that some of those standing here will not die before they see the Son of Man coming with his kingdom. So, is the word, so said the word of God.
Our text for this week, the 13th Sunday after Pentecost, continues the discourse documented in the Gospel of Matthew between Jesus and the disciples as they travel in the region of Caesarea Philippi. Last week I preached on the eight verses that come before this, so everything I said last week plus some new stuff for this week. Our lectionary cycle of readings breaks up the passage over two Sundays, although they both concern the same teaching moment by Jesus with the disciples. A possible reason for this is that the opening words that we heard read in this service mark a turning point in Jesus' ministry. It is the first of the passion predictions by Jesus concerning the great suffering he will endure at the hands of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and that he will be killed and on the third day be raised. From this point on, his healing ministry and public teaching take a back seat as he and the disciples travel south to Jerusalem. Last week, Simon Peter was head of the class when he answered the question posed by Jesus, Who do you say I am? Peter was given a new name befitting the role he would play in the new Jesus community. He was to be the rock, and Jesus proclaims, On this rock I will build my church. However, as the dialogue continues, the rock quickly becomes a stumbling block. In the light of Jesus' prediction, Peter takes Jesus aside and remarks in astonishment, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. To be sure and not to be too harsh on Peter, he probably spoke for all the disciples, voicing the thoughts of their hearts as well. They just didn't grasp God's vision for the Messiah. They were stuck on preconceived notions from past Jewish history, grounded in an experience of power and authority. That Jesus the Messiah would suffer and die was inconceivable to them. The resurrection piece of the prediction was quickly overlooked as they focused solely on the suffering and death part. In reply, Jesus offers a stern rebuke to Peter, which in itself must have been pretty hurtful considering all that had transpired earlier in the conversation. Jesus exclaims, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me because your thoughts are not those of God, but human thoughts. We should pause here and note that Satan or Satan means in general enemy and not a single person or entity. So now Peter, the loyal follower of Jesus, is grouped with those enemies of Jesus' mission in the world. Indeed, human thoughts are not God's thoughts, and Jesus will continue to challenge the disciples to see things from the perspective of God and God's vision for the kingdom of heaven. Jesus goes on to speak on what discipleship, to be a follower of his, will mean for the disciples. The rebuke of Peter quickly turns into an opportunity to teach the disciples about what it means to be the Messiah. And this will be a major focus for the remainder of Matthew's gospel. In this lesson on what it means to be a follower, Jesus doesn't break off his relationship with Peter, but he chooses to use the opportunity as a teaching moment. If any want to become my followers, 
Let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. In the context of the first century Jesus movement, many of Peter's brethren would, like Jesus, lose their life to the enemies of God's kingdom. Crucifixion was an all too common occurrence under Roman occupation. According to legends and New Testament accounts in the book of Acts, there may only have been one of the twelve who actually died a natural death. For the disciples, Jesus was making clear that martyrdom was a distinct possibility for them if they came to the attention of hostile authorities as his followers. There is certainly more that can be said about this text. We've only really reached verse 24, and I'm more than halfway through the number of words I have allotted myself to share with you today. So let's turn our focus back to the Pentecost theme of discipleship. For us followers of Jesus in 2020, what does that powerful command to deny themselves and take up their cross mean? What does that losing your life for my sake look like? Those questions, I think, speak to the core of what we are about. I think to deny oneself has a more metaphorical meaning for us followers today. What are the things that keep us from living in the kingdom way? From living that salt of the earth life, that light of the world commitment that Jesus calls us to and that Jesus has spoken about earlier in the Sermon on the Mount. To deny means to disassociate oneself from a statement or a person. And we know that Simon Peter later in Matthew will deny any association with Jesus. But I think too that to deny carries the extended meaning of disassociation from systems that hold us hostage, that hold me hostage to a worldview that obscures the values of the kingdom of heaven that Jesus taught about. What are those familiar and comfortable things that have such a hold on us, that they prevent us from recognizing and participating in the inbreaking of God's kingdom? Those are the things that are indeed the enemies of God's mission and dream for humankind. For example, it is now clearly recognized that white male systems of paramilitary law enforcement are a failure. They have disadvantaged and threatened the lives of black, indigenous, and people of color for far too long. The devastating consequences of widespread racism feed a school to prison pipeline in the US and Canada, where black, indigenous, and people of color are overrepresented in the general population. For me to deny oneself asks me to dig deeper, to question how the ways I am made comfortable in this society put others at a profound disadvantage. For example, why do policing services privilege white middle-class property owners like myself? And certainly this kind of Self-denial work is a challenge. That's what makes self-denial so hard. That's where human thoughts push up against divine thoughts. But here's the thing. Jesus offers his followers the means to break free. His life and teachings provide us with a cross to bear. By taking up that cross, we partner with Christ in the inbreaking of God's realm on earth. As a faith community, as followers of the way, 
we are called to bear the cross, not alone, but corporately and together. Jesus has shown us a better way. The life of Jesus points us to an understanding of what God's righteousness looks like. It's that kingdom of heaven vision of what it means to be human and what contributes to human flourishing. And for sure, the Jesus vision breaks in. For sure, it breaks in. Disrupting our comfort and challenging our complacency with those systems that we have never questioned before. It happens when black NBA players stay in their locker room. Last Wednesday, in the midst of the playoffs, the Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and Bucks didn't come out of their dressing room for their 4 p.m. tip-off. By their actions, they were protesting the shooting of Jacob Blake by police in their home state. The NBA, for one night, shut down. Sports commentators, many who are black, were left improvising conversations to fill that airtime, and these quickly turned to sharing their personal experiences of what being black in America is like. Can you imagine all of those television sets, all of those people tuned in to hearing these experiences when you had just turned in, tuned in to relax, watch a basketball game? All of a sudden, you are living those experiences too. For one night, millions of television viewers were confronted with the realities of racism and the lived experiences of their neighbors who live under a system that privileges white skin. For one night, the inbreaking of God's realm united us in righteous indignation that any of God's children would have to suffer from such discrimination. May the kingdom of God be realized in all places where there is injustice. And, O oh God, may it be now. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's join our hearts in prayer. God of all, as we pray for our world and all who dwell in it, we grasp hold of, you, hold of you and each other, knowing that strength comes from community and faith and that we encounter you as we pray together. O oh God, for teachers and parents and children struggling in this time of COVID-19 with anxiety over school restarting, we pray. with those experiencing the stress of job loss and reduced income, we pray. For those feeling trapped at home with increased responsibility as caregivers, we pray. For those anxious for this whole COVID-19 thing to be over so they can get on with life, we pray. We pray, O oh God, that in your wisdom all things for our human flourishing will we be revealed in due course. Grant us patience, grant us courage, grant us strength as we travel this pandemic road together. Remind us to be kind and to hold one another gently and tenderly. For those who, O oh God, who wrestle with illness and infirmity, we pray. We remember especially those in hospital facing tests and procedure, those in nursing home and long-term care homes, and those friends and families mourning the loss of their loved ones. For those who are made to feel less than whole 
because of their sexual orientation, gender expression, and gender identity. We pray. For those endangered by racism and the color of their skin, we pray. For those who do not have safe water and enough to eat, we pray. For those living on the edge of desperation, we pray. For those who live in conflict, we pray. And we pray especially, O oh God, for our church here at Park Royal, for the gift of community and relationships. May we never forget the reason for which we are acting, to live more compassionately in the world and continue as faithful followers walking in the way of Jesus. We are your beloved, a light to the world. Receive these our prayers, O God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Looking at the community happenings for this week, I just remind everyone that our um, masks for uh, school, Mask for Students campaign is still underway and the tote is at the Parkview uh, Drive entrance where you can drop off your masks or uh, you can also make a monetary donation and those are all very gratefully received as the new school year will be getting underway soon. I think I've covered everything uh, that needs to be said for this week in the uh, community happenings. Although we are not physically meeting, of course, the work of the church is continuing each week, and we are thankful for the many gifts that are coming in through PAR, through the envelopes, and the givings online. So let us have an offertory prayer at this time. Loving God, accept these gifts as the thanksgiving for your many blessings. Accept these gifts as our commitment to your kingdom. Accept these gifts and accept our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Dear friends, go into the world as brothers and sisters and siblings in Christ. Support and comfort one another. Challenge and encourage one another. Surprise one another with your concern. Respond to one another's need with compassion and work together to build up this community of faith. And may the love of God, the peace of Christ, and the nurture of the Holy Spirit 
be with you now and always. Go in peace. Amen.